Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have a story where somebody drinks a thermometer. Blood definitely has strange properties that cannot yet be explained by science. I was once working freelance IT, read, I did odd jobs for my school's IT department when I was in high school, and had to make a blood sacrifice. The student photocopier, already a bad sign, printers are the spawn of Satan, had jammed up because someone tried to print a 100-slide PowerPoint full-sized 10 times. So I opened up the front door, pulled out the jammed paper, and closed it back up. Unfortunately, the job was not over, as the printer still said it was jammed. I opened it back up, saw nothing, and closed it back up. Still jammed, even after a restart. So I opened it back up, poked around, and I accidentally cut my finger on some exposed metal inside. I shouted, is that what you want? A blood sacrifice? And slammed it shut. Immediately it started printing the next job in the printer queue. So you know, sometimes if you just get frustrated and hit stuff, it'll actually work, but I wouldn't recommend you try that in most instances. Here's a rat story offering for my industrial hydrogen peroxide production. The large tanks at a hydrogen peroxide plant have special guards on the atmospheric vents to prevent rats from getting in. In the past, a rat climbed in and fell into the 90% hydrogen peroxide. The iron in the rat's blood was enough to catalyze the runaway decomposition of the entire contents. Kawoosh! So if this doesn't make sense to you, basically you can catalyze the decomposition of peroxide using a metal. And in this case, the rat had all the metal the peroxide needed. Rest in peace, Mousy. It blows my mind that all these labs shut off their fume hoods automatically. If they're worried that much about making money, just make it coin-operated, LMAO. Yeah, seriously, the universities that are concerned about saving money should actually spend their time protecting their students because electricity is a lot cheaper than a lawsuit. I have a good story that taught me an important lesson. So in undergrad, I worked with iron tricarbonyl compounds, specifically cyclopenadienone iron tricarbonyl compounds for those who are interested. And one of the variants I synthesized was particularly non-dense and heavily affected by static electricity, making it a pain to weigh out since it would just go anywhere but the weigh paper. I have experienced this many times, and usually salts are the worst for this. Although some stuff that has like a lot of really greasy portions to the molecule can also be bad. After complaining to my research advisor about this chemical, he informed me that sometimes removing your gloves reduces static buildup and makes weighing easier. By the way, this isn't a good piece of advice. There's this thing called a static gun that you can get, and it just neutralizes the charge, and that can oftentimes help. If your lab's a little bit too cheap, just go on Amazon and buy one. They're relatively cheap. I think they're like less than 30 bucks, and it can save you a lot of headaches. So I tried it out, and it didn't really help, and this iron compound still flew all over the place. Nonetheless, I set up my reaction before lunch and hurried out of the lab, because I was starving. So I'm eating my peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch, and I noticed every couple bites are particularly bitter. I didn't put too much thought into it, and continued eating. Over the next week, every bowel movement I had was fierce and watery. Diarrhea. I had diarrhea for a week. Not the, eh, it's just not solid kind when you have to go. It was the, boy, you better run for it if you don't want to throw out your underwear and pants, because it's coming out right now kind. It took me an embarrassingly long amount of time, like two weeks later, to realize that I must have gotten this iron tricarbonyl compound on my hands. That's terrifying, and since I left the lab without washing my hands, I accidentally ingested it, causing severe week-long diarrhea. Suffice to say, I always wash my hands when entering and exit the lab. I also make sure to wear gloves, like, all the time in the lab, too. Yeah, that's very scary. You don't know what your chemicals could possibly do to you, so it is a very good idea to always wear gloves. It's also important to wash your hands before and after doing lab work. When I finished high school on our last chem lesson, I hugged my chem teacher while wearing a lab coat. A day later, there were rashes on my hands and little fluid-filled blisters formed for two weeks. It was very itchy. I don't know what it was, but I'm pretty sure it was something on the back of my teacher's lab coat. I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm pretty sure your teacher gave you herpes. In the medical laboratory I worked at, we had a chemistry department that ran fecal fat tests. So my presumption here is they're just measuring fat content in feces, because you typically have some significant portion of feces containing fat. I think it's like more than 10% usually. The specimens were 96-hour collections and arrived in paint cans. One day, a tech who didn't follow instructions very well was running a batch of fecal fats. The procedure to obtain a representative sample of the stool specimen involved putting the paint can on a standard hardware store paint shaker, then in the fume hood. Cover the can with paper towels and open it away from yourself. This tech forgot the paper towels and he opened it towards himself. The pressure that had built up caused the feces to forcibly spray into his face, in his eyes, nose, and mouth. His story was used afterwards as a warning to all the new techs who were learning fecal fat analysis. 
So the most relatable thing to this that I have is if you're ever venting a separatory funnel, you always vent away from yourself and anybody else. And it's always good to vent often in the case of using a set funnel. I know someone who built up pressure in a separatory funnel and it actually ruptured and sprayed a reaction mixture all over them. Fortunately, they were okay, but you might not be as lucky as they were. So definitely if you're ever opening pressurized vessels, do it away from yourself, especially if you're working with poop. The worst experience that I had in a lab was when one group was having trouble getting samples prepared for analysis, so I was asked to help out for a week. I was new and not fully trained, so I was happy to help out and learn something new. Turns out that this group was processing pig tissue samples to determine if the compound or its metabolites were being distributed in the pig, and if they were building up or being cleared. In order to track the chemical and concentration accurately, it was fairly radioactive. I can't remember how radioactive, I just remember it was much higher than what I was normally working with to dose cultured cells. When I found this out, I figured there would be some highly specialized machinery in a hood to pulverize the samples, or we would be cutting them into smaller pieces and using chemicals for the rest. But no, we were just blending them on the bench with a cheap Walmart blender and a food processor. The roughly one to three cubic inch chunks of pig had to be blended while frozen so that the later tests would be accurate. Thus, I found myself pouring liquid nitrogen over radioactive chunks of pig, putting it into a blender with dry ice to keep it frozen during blending. It would sublimate in the freezer, and praying that the cheap carafe wouldn't crack open as I felt the chunks violently strike the sides of the carafe as they broke down. Thankfully, they at least used metal carafes. This mostly worked, except for the skin samples, with the hair and fat still attached. The fat just didn't fully freeze, so the dull blades would get like 2 millimeters into the cubes and jam. So for every 3 seconds of blending, you would have to stop and try to pry the fat off the blade, with probably 20 or 30 pounds of force or more, while trying not to have any shoot off onto you once it released. This slowed things way down, and the person I was helping was extremely impatient. It was not uncommon for me to see poofs of powdered dry ice shoot out of her carafe, hopefully with no sample, as she was rushing to do this, and she sometimes would splash solvents when clearing out the carafe between each of the hundreds of samples. After a few long days of this, and after her not getting any better despite warnings from me and several superiors, I told my boss that I had had enough. I wasn't hired to do this, and that I would never process samples like this ever again. I know that it can be done this way safely, but only when being careful and not rushed. The moral of the story is, always say you're busy until you know what you're getting into. This probably goes for any job, but especially this. P.S. The person I was helping moved to another group, one that didn't work with radio-labeled compounds. Yeah, it's probably good that they found uh, another lab to work in, one that's far away from you. Technically not research, but I was a witness to a biocontamination story recently. I was doing a night shift as an intern at an urgent care wing. One of the younger interns with me was assigned a patient with skin lesions suspected of being syphilitic, which if you're not sure what that means, it means it's suspected that they have syphilis. Of course, the poor man thoroughly examined the patient and their lesions without so much as gloves. For those who don't know, skin lesions from syphilis are very treponemic, i.e. very contagious. He got a prophylactic injection of IM penicillin G benzathione during his shift, which is a painful way to learn about workplace safety in a medical setting. Hospitals in general are full of scary stories, especially if underfunded and overcrowded. Just recently, I learned of studies showing that most of the bar soap patients bathed with at our infirmary was colonized by multi-drug resistant acinobacter. That is terrifying. It just blows my mind that stuff like that happens. Like, why would you not just be less cheap and get different soap for all of the patients? Perhaps all of the bars of soap here just happen to be contaminated, but that is a terrifying story, and that makes me very concerned. The only chemistry that should be done in a bedroom is not one that many chemists get anyway. Wow, I think, uh, I think we just got roasted here. I am in my fourth semester at the moment, and there is one recent story in our university that happened last year about one student in her first semester and one of her first days in the lab. She got the sulfuric acid bottle from the storage and wanted to bring it to her fume hood. The assistant was friendly, telling her that she should use a bucket to transport the acid the next time. So, after a while, she had to bring it back and didn't really know what the assistant was talking about, but she had the bucket. After thinking a bit, she must have thought, oh, I just have to pour the acid into the bucket and walk with it and then put it back into the bottle. And so that's what she did, except the part with filling it back into the bottle. That did not happen anymore. I really would have loved to see the reaction of the assistant. He must have just been speechless, I guess. So basically what happened here is, uh, if you're transporting something corrosive, or in general, if it, if it would be bad if the bottle broke, it's good to use a secondary container. And so that's what the person's saying. Use a bucket, use a secondary container. But what the student thought is, oh, I just pour the chemical into the bucket, and then I pour it back into the bottle. And so uh, that's what they did, except I guess they just left the acid in the bucket and then went away, which is uh, not great.
The story of the postdoc and alkaline metal fire reminds me of a story of some kind of legend at my university. I have never met him, to my knowledge, but he was handed from department to department with the reason that he is not suitable for what they were doing there. This guy is a menace. I would have to get in touch with colleagues to get more stories, but there is one that I do remember. He was under the lab bench tinkering with a vacuum pump, clearly not knowing what he was doing. When I asked what he was doing, he said he could tune the vacuum pump in a way so that he could separate cations from anions from a solution on the rotovap. I don't know what happened to him in the end, but I doubt he graduated. Thinking about it, he might have been schizophrenic or something, because one guy alone can't be that dumb. Everyone seemed to know him and had their own whimsical story. So I have a kind of similar story here. So this has actually happened with several different researchers that I've trained, and every time the question gets asked, I have no idea why they're asking that. So oftentimes students are preparing a procedure in their lab notebook. They're maybe doing one of their first experiments in the research lab, and they're going to weigh out some salt for a reaction. Whatever the salt is varies for each researcher. And so they always ask me like, oh, when I'm writing out the weight, do I need to include the weight of the anion? And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, well, like we only care about the cation, so do I have to include the weight of the anion? And I'm like, well, only if you use the scale and you only weigh out the cations, but not the anions. And they look at me like, wait, you can do that? I'm like, no, you can't do that. What do you mean? It's a salt. It has to be neutral, right? Like there has to be a positive and negative charge. And so, uh, you know, sometimes undergrads, they say the darndest things. My mom has a story. Okay, this is the best story of today's episode. In the mid-70s, she was in a high school science lesson. This school was in a deprived area, and some of the pupils were what you would now call troubled. The way she remembers it, the practical that day involved adding ice and salt to water while monitoring the temperature. I guess the topic was basic enthalpy or something. Anyway, two of her friends heard the teacher warn them about not dropping the alcohol thermometers and decided it would be a good idea to steal several. The idea was to drink the contents and get buzzed during school hours. So during the lunch break, these two chuckleheads broke open the thermometers and poured the contents into a bottle of orange juice, which they shared. They started to feel unwell about 30 minutes later and went to the school nurse. Once they owned up, the science teacher was called to check on what they had drank. The teacher came running and shouted, call an ambulance. It turned out that the school was using a mixed batch of thermometers and that the two chuckleheads had stolen a combination of alcohol and mercury thermometers, oh no, which they had then mixed and drank. My town didn't have its own major hospital until the late 80s, and so that was a 40-minute ambulance ride to the nearest casualty department. Needless to say, the two boys were expelled for this incident. Yeah, you should not be drinking the contents of a thermometer. What the heck? That's so dumb. There's other ways to get alcohol if you're desperate, and I would never ever drink the contents of a thermometer to meet that need. Oh my gosh. Once, I had a motorized bicycle I wanted to repaint. Seeing that the paint stripping solvents were kind of expensive for me at the time, and that I had a lot of easy start fluid lying around, I figured that I'd use that, since it's clearly a solvent too and likely to work. And it kind of did, but it made me a lot goofier and slower in my work. I realized that the ether was getting to me, even in a well-ventilated area. So in this case, easy start fluid is an ether. I believe it's diethyl ether, but it might be methyl terbutyl ether. Lessons learned. 1. Ether fumes aren't just a fire hazard, they also affect your thinking and reflexes. 2. Spray paint doesn't last on surfaces if you keep spilling gasoline on it, and the bike looked a lot cleaner in bare aluminum anyway. Yeah, the real takeaway here is if you're not a scientist and you're working with some chemical for your car or whatever, it's important to not just consider the flammability. A lot of those things have unknown toxicity, and people in your circles might not talk about the toxicity of those compounds because they might not be aware of it. So you can always go above and beyond and look into the safety protocols required for those chemicals, and you can be the person in your community that makes a difference. Not a chemist, but my parents were chemists, and I had devoured, so to speak, all of their college textbooks while I was still in high school. We had a chem lab in my sophomore year, doing fun stuff, nothing terribly dangerous. The worst thing that happened was when we made iron sulfide the usual way, and then the obligatory H2S generation, hydrogen sulfide generation, with hydrochloric acid. At some point, another teacher walks in and yells, TURN ON THE VENTILATOR! The lab had very strong ventilation, but somehow it was off that day and nobody had noticed. I guess we were past the concentration where we could smell the hydrogen sulfide and were well on our way to meeting our ancestors. Hydrogen sulfide is extremely dangerous, and it's very easy to receive a lethal dose if you're not careful. You should not generate hydrogen sulfide unless you have extreme training that makes it safe for you to do so. Hydrogen sulfide is deadly. Super duper deadly. Then there was this other kid from the previous year who did the sulfuric acid plus KMnO4 at home, thinking that he could generate oxygen like the textbook said. He generated manganese heptoxide instead, and ended up in the hospital with sulfuric acid infused glass shrapnel all over his face. He wasn't wearing goggles, but he had really thick glasses which saved his eyesight. 
Yeah, this is another important reminder here. If you're wearing glasses in a research lab or in a teaching lab, you should always wear proper safety glasses over top of your normal glasses or get the special covers that go around the side of your glasses. You need to protect all of your eyes and the glasses will not provide enough protection if something like this goes wrong. And so the takeaway here is like, yes, manganese heptoxide can generate oxygen, but it can also generate ozone amongst other terrible things. It will also produce lots of fumes of manganese dioxide, which is undesirable as a living thing. I love these stories and I wanted to contribute. Obligatory, not a chemist, but a pathologist. We don't work with too dangerous of chemicals, but we live with 10% buffered neutral formalin basically everywhere in the grossing lab. This story happened during my residency while I was grossing my cart of surgical specimens, which entails cutting the specimens into smaller pieces so that we can process them into slides that we can study. We use very sharp scalpels, and under the fume hood, everything is basically covered in a thick layer of formalin. While all of this was going on, I didn't notice a small nick in my gloves. We were usually double-gloved while grossing. And I went my merry way, cutting and conversing with my colleagues, until I finished all of my specimens in about two hours. At this time, I really didn't notice anything until I removed my gloves. Until I removed my gloves and noticed a cold breeze over my pinky and ring fingers on my left hand. Horrified, I looked down and my hand looked like it had stayed one full day underwater, and then the strong scent of formalin hit me. I went and washed my hands for a couple of minutes, but the damage was done. For two weeks it hurt like hell, moving my fingers, but no long-lasting damage. Been checking obsessively my gloves ever since. Yeah, I've had this several times when washing glassware, where it's like, fine, everything is going well, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll notice I have kind of a weird sensation in my finger, and I'll take my glove off, and it's clear that my finger has been like drenched in acetone probably for half an hour. And it's like, oh, that's not good. It's probably not the worst thing ever, but it's not good, you know? You don't want to get solvents on your finger, and formaldehyde is even more terrifying. So today's Yikes awardee is Jav De Silva. One time, me and a friend in the university lab were working with potassium permanganate and sulfuric acid. I asked if he washed the graduated cylinder, and he said yes. So I used it to measure a nearly saturated potassium permanganate solution. Well, it goes without saying that the glassware was not clean and a cloud of purple and brown fumes shot up over our heads. The professor in charge of the lab was quite chill and just laughed as he turned on the extractors and walked into his office. Good times. I don't know if that is a good time. I think the professor probably should have done something a little bit better there. Thanks for listening to this episode, and I hope you have a great day. That chemist. I'm going to rank chemicals. The viewer. Based off of versatility and safety? Anakin stare. Versatility and safety, right?